and welcome to the Kuyamange Institute, our Q&A conversation for exploration series. I'm Paul Robert, the Executive Director and President of the Institute, and along with my wife, Laura Lee, the Director of Research, Education, and Outreach. On behalf of our Board of Directors, our advisors, volunteers, and supporting members, we want to thank you for joining us today. The Kuyamange Institute is an independent, nonprofit research organization committed to researching consciousness in the human experience, following the footsteps of our founder, anthropologist, Dr. Felicitas Goodman. Our focus is reflected in three main areas, experience, education, and exploration. We respect the path of academic balance, the creative pursuit of science, while advancing, conserving, and restoring a direct experience of that deeper human connection to all of life. It's part of our mission to expand our own experiential research with the multidisciplinary uh, understanding that's available to us today. So as an educational institution, we take an open approach. And we're, luckily, we are happy to invite scholars in related fields to help broaden the scope of our own work and exploration. That's why we call this conversation for exploration. These weekly discussions have included neuroscience and anthropology and archaeology and archaeoastronomy, eco-spirituality, philosophy, psychology, mythology, shamanism, hey, it's ritual. It's a great world out there and we go exploring. From, yes, exactly. From the arts to the sciences and so much in between. Um, we have a couple hundred of these presentations, these webcasts on YouTube, and we have another hundred or so podcasts that are available at our website at kuyamungainstitute.com. All these presentations are free, and as a nonprofit, of course, we want to invite you to become a supporting member, join our inner circle, and we want to thank you, the community members who continue to support the mission of the Kuyamunga Institute. Today, we continue our conversation on the growing recognition and exploration of the connections between science and spirituality. Now, while they've always mainly been seen as two distinct domains, of human expression. In recent times, there's been a significant movement in bridging of the science and spirituality. And it makes sense. I mean, this quest of understanding the role of our human spirit would eventually be reflected in what? Quantum physics, neuroscience, consciousness studies. The time's come for us to discover this sense of the sacred, not just in science, but in our everyday life. And of course, as an institute, this has been a significant part of our mission, and it's reflected in our own personal life journey as well. Well, indeed, Paul. Early on in my life, and I suspect perhaps for the majority of us, it at some point becomes evident that we're missing half the equation for describing the nature of reality. And through direct experience alone, we can quickly come to the conclusion that there's much more to our world than our culture generally lets on or even officially acknowledges. Especially the sciences does not like to admit to what it cannot see under the microscope, which puts all of us at a distinct disadvantage as the larger part of the spectrum is invisible to our senses or our instrumentation. So little wonder that we're missing half the equation Yet we've all experienced it. We can all personally testify to it. We live it. We can wonder, what will our world look like? And who will we be when we collectively speak to the full story on the nature of reality and of ourselves? Let's check in with David Lorimer. He's long been tackling these questions and written a few books on it. These include Science, Consciousness, and Ultimate Reality. The Spirit of Science, From Experiment to Experience, I like the sound of that, and uh, Just Out, A New Renaissance, Transforming Science, Spirit, and Society, lots to talk about today. What evidence amassed? What key questions? Uh, and what are the glimpses that we have of them? What's on the horizon? And what is this Galileo Commission that he chairs? Let's welcome David. He's from, uh, he's British, living in France. In Cathar country, um, in the foothills of the Pyrenees, we were just there, David, with the Niao cave in 2019, a Paleolithic painted cave. Um, also visited Carcassonne, a medieval village. Love to talk to you about that. 
Uh, I understand you do a whole full thing on the Cathars, but that's another story. But welcome, and uh, thanks for all that you've done welcome, to babe. merge science and spirituality. Thank you. Nice to be here with everyone. Yeah. So our, our quests start early on. When did yours start to question our society is not giving us the full picture of what we're living in this in this fascinating universe? How did it start for you? Well, I suppose it all depends on how far back you go. Um, but I think a, a, a key moment for me was in my final year at university. Uh, I was studying French literature and I was studying a poem by Charles Baudelaire called Correspondance, which is a very famous poem. And I looked up in the index or the notes and found that uh, this idea of correspondences was influenced by a Swedish um, thinker called Emanuel Swedenborg. Uh -huh. So I thought, well, that sounds interesting. And so I, I got a biography out of the university library. And one Saturday evening, I stayed in and started reading it. And I was absolutely riveted um, because here was one of the most distinguished scientists and engineers, neuroscientists you know, of his generation, of his time, um, writing about his encounters in the spiritual world, the nature of invisible reality, and, and expanding his own view and experience beyond <clears throat> the, the visible spectrum, as you've been talking about. And so that was a, <clears throat> that was a real eye-opener. And when I went to, to London... Um, I joined the Swedenborg Society and I was soon on the council and, and then I was president of the Swedenborg Society between 2001 and 2003 uh, and I was given, I had quite a few of his books already, but I was given his complete works by um, a mentor of mine, Norman Coburn, <clears throat> um, in the late 1970s and uh, so I've read quite a lot, but he, this was a real turning point. Um, for me, because um, not only for the the psychic part, as it were, but also for the spiritual part, because the, the one of his main spiritual books is called Divine Love and Wisdom. And he explains that um, in terms of the Holy Communion, for instance, the divine love corresponds to wine and the divine wisdom to bread. And and so that appealed to me, the idea that um, symbolically in the Holy Communion, you were receiving love and wisdom at yeah. the same time as you were receiving wine and bread. So that, that was a very important um, starting point um, for my quest, if you like. And what is the Galileo Commission? That's a group of uh, like minds really trying to further this um, equation, this meeting point of science and spirituality. Tell us about that. You're the chair. Yes, well, that's that's obviously far further down the line um, in, in biographical terms. These, the Galileo Commission is a project of the Scientific and Medical Network, and the network was founded in 1973, which means we're celebrating our Golden Jubilee um, this year, uh, along with the Institute of Neurotic Sciences, um, which is, does very similar work from a similar point of view. And, and uh, we, we set up the Galileo Commission in 2017. And um, the first thing that, the first major thing that we did was to commission the Galileo Commission report um, by Professor Dr. Harold Wallach, who's a German professor, interdisciplinary um, professor. And, and we launched this in, in 2018. Um, and already we had a hundred advisors from 30 different universities and um, so we wanted this document to have um, intellectual and academic authority and the reason why it's called the Galileo Commission um, is because we're inviting scientists metaphorically to look through the telescope at the enormous evidence base for um, the genuine status um, both epistemologically and ontologically um, of spiritual and psychic experiences. And hopefully foment another revolution in science. Yes, indeed, yes. And so so we've now got about 1,600 people on our mailing list. We've got over 500 
professional affiliates and these are people in the academics um, in in different contexts and universities um, and in fact today i've been spending quite a lot of my time you know, compiling our latest report um, and starting to write the grant proposal for the next cycle in 2024 2026 Mm -hmm. And we, we hold monthly lectures. Um, <clears throat> we we have individual projects. Uh, the two projects that um, I'm most involved in right now are the Transcendence, Not Transhumanism project. And we have a meeting on Tuesday on that topic. Yeah. And the other one is Synchronicity and the Nature of Reality. And we've got a meeting, a public meeting on that at the end of October. So those are two of our projects, which I'm, I'm currently working on. How exciting to sit with so many like minds. Did most of these scientists arrive at this conclusion? There's more to reality than we than we say through their own personal experience or through their intellectual. Um, uh, mainly through personal experience. Yeah, <laughs> and, and as much. Last year, we we published a volume called Spiritual Awakenings. And which I edited um, with Marjorie Willicott, who's the main editor. And this, this is short accounts of transformative experiences and processes from 57 academics and scientists. And it's received stellar reviews. And if you look at the Amazon reviews, they're all five star. And, and um, so it really speaks to people, but because the, you can take these people seriously, because almost all of them have got PhDs. Um, and many of them have taught or are teaching in universities. Um, and it shows the very point you made. That, yes, that, that the, the real transformation comes from experience, not reading. Um, and if you're trained as a scientist, then you're trained in scientific materialism. In other words, you're trained to think the brain produces consciousness. And you just take that for granted. Um, until you come up against something like what we're talking about um, and that you know transforms revolutionizes your worldview i want to just say that let's take each other let's like, take all of us seriously and for the scientists they're speaking in a scientific language that's a language the rest of us have many other languages to speak on but let's take us all seriously right right um, yeah well, I just think that, you know, coming back to the, the core of, of what you're saying, as I understand it, it's that it's that we're pushing that envelope where we're uh, that we have to find greater evidence of these types of aspects of the human story that need to be recognized. And we, we, we when we limit ourselves to thinking that consciousness is a physical phenomenon within the brain, or can we take it to another level and say we don't know? And it's okay to not know because that unknown aspect of it, that field of the unknown is where the, the field of science wants to go. That's where it should go is to more further the discovery rather than the limitation of, of trying yeah. to hold it to a specific point in, in place. So we hear from a, a lot of science types too and academic types that here's what I personally believe. Here's what I'm allowed to say in my field. Indeed. Yeah. yeah. Indeed. And not... Well, I, one of the things I've been doing this afternoon, in fact, just before this meeting, is writing a paragraph on William James, mm. um, because William James was the great American psychologist who published Principles of Psychology in 1890 and gave the famous Gifford Lectures at Edinburgh University. But in 1898, he gave the Ingersoll Lecture on Immortality, which is a key text. Uh, partly drawing on an earlier book by an Oxford philosopher called F.C.S. Schiller, um, a book that came out in 1891. And the point that he was making was that we know that there's a close relationship between the brain and consciousness, but what kind of relationship is it? That's mm -hmm. the question he's asking himself. And most scientists then and now assume that the relationship is one of production or generation than that the brain produces a generator <laughs> consciousness. Not transmitter receiver, but no. generator. That's a well, really that's what, big distinction. Yeah. Well, that's what James has said. And James said there are two other ways of looking at it. And um, you can look at it as a transmissive function, or you can look at it as a permissive function that certain certain range of experience um, is enabled to come through the brain, which is rather the view that Henri Bergson um, took. 
And so what James said at the time, and this is still true today, and it's really the cutting edge of what we're still trying to do, mm -hmm. is that if you look at normal science, normal neuroscience, normal psychology and philosophy of his time and ours, then the idea that the or the theory that the brain produces consciousness um, is obvious to you. And most of the research questions are unaffected by um, that, that assumption. In other words, you can just you can go along with your research. But as soon as you get into this area of spiritual and psychic experience um, well documented and scientifically studied, then your theory is completely inadequate. It can't account for mm -hmm. any any evidence for survival of consciousness, uh, any evidence for um, children who remember previous lives, um, any or the evidence near death experience, for or... out of body experiences near death. Uh, yeah. All of these things have to be ignored or dismissed, uh, which is what the most skeptical um, materialists do. And so we've really got a philosophical problem here. We haven't got a scientific problem. We've got a philosophical problem, okay. um, which is the metaphysical foundations of science. And that's a book by Edwin Burt, which came out in 1925, mm -hmm. The Metaphysical Foundations of Modern Science. There's unconscious assumptions and presuppositions which scientists take for granted when they should be questioning them and asking whether the theory needs their theory needs adjusting. And, and that's why we call it the Galileo Commission, because we're inviting people to look through the telescope at the evidence space that's already there and has been there for a hundred years. Yeah. So it's really a, a clash of the worldview, which is um, really a, a question for all of us. What is the worldview that we're holding? And what is the role of the human? Are we generating this, mm -hmm. right? Consciousness, or are we receiving it? Is the universe broadcasting it? And we're just opening up our bandwidth to play with it. I mean, such a, a different, you just lay that out so nicely. Mm -hmm. What is it that allows the human being to have so much hubris to think that we're the generator of all of this? That's this transhuman, this is, this. I mean, it's a psychological as well as a philosophical issue, it seems to me. Well, it, it all comes down to how do you define a human being? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And therefore, you know, what is human life really about? Cool. And, and if, you, if you take a purely materialistic, bodily, physicalist, naturalist view, and then the whole universe produced us by chance. And uh, we don't have any free will uh, because every process is, in fact, physical. And the physical processes in the brain um, generate our experience and our choices. Um, and um, you may as well make the most of the short-term opportunity that you've got here by making as much money as possible and exploiting the planet and other people for your own benefit. And so it leads to a very selfish, logically it leads to a very selfish view, the results of which are all around us. That's why a friend of mine describes our current religion as consumerism, right? And, um, and if you understand that we can touch the hem of something larger than ourselves then there's something beyond us right and then that's a spiritual quest so um... no totally uh, and the i mean the consumerism is 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 a is an output or an outcrop from materialism and because consumerism is about material goods and the idea that you can buy happiness by buying goods or buying experiences uh, and this this simply doesn't add up, and and many surveys and 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 studies have shown that your your happiness um, is only correlated with income up to a certain point, mm -hmm. uh, and one and once your basic needs have been met, then it's really happiness is an is an inside job, as they say. <laughs> Which is why we just last week spoke to a billionaire who was using his wealth to revitalize a whole ecosystem, right? Right, at, in a national park in Africa, and he posed the question: How many billions do you need to make? When at what point is it about giving back and and uh, yeah. on a quest to really play with these dynamics of life and enhance them? Yeah. So, um. 
So most of the scientists that you work with in the Galileo Commission have had these personal experiences, these um, direct experiences of spirit, mystical moments? Yes, and not only that, but um, all the founders of the scientific and medical network had mystical experiences. And so they they knew, and, and they were very distinguished lot. It was George Blaker, who was a very senior Indian civil servant um, and, and, and worked at the Department of Education and Science. And uh, then there was Dr. Peter Leggett, who was vice chancellor of Surrey University. Then there was Sir Kelvin Spencer, who was chief scientist at the Ministry of Power in the 1950s. And then finally, there was Dr. Patrick Shackleton, who was dean of the faculty, postgraduate faculty of medicine at Southampton University. So all of these men had mystical experiences. So they knew personally that there was more to reality than was described by physical science. And that's why they founded the network, so that um, people who had these experiences but were scientifically based or medically based, uh, or engineers or psychologists, could come together in a safe space, which we still provide, um, in order to uh, discuss and explore these experiences. So is yeah. it a bit like a like the proverbial AA meeting where you stand up and you say, I'm so-and-so and I've had a mystical experience and here's <laughs> what it is. Because I find My that when you Paul. create a safe space, yeah. the stories that come forth yeah. from all of us, all walks of life, everyone has, this, has had those mystical moments and seek them out in some way or another. Mm -hmm. So isn't that the yeah, universe trying to tell us what it is? Yeah. Yeah, we just need to listen better. So tell us about your own mystical experiences. You talked about finding Swedenborg, but what was your own? Uh, to be honest, I've, I'm rather short on mystical experiences. Um, I, I've read a lot more about them than, than I've experienced. But um, something resonates deep within you. To uh, say. Yeah, well, no, I, I, have, I have had some experiences of divine love. They've been very, very short, you know, not more than a minute or two. Um, but I've had three of those, and um, they have, you know, they, they've had a profound um, effect. And, and one of those um, was, well, one was when I was listening to Albert Schweitzer playing the Dorian Fugue um, by J.S. Bach. Um, at a certain point, um, I just had this extraordinary feeling. And, and another was um, the death of Peter Leggett. And the third one was when I went to Bulgaria with my now wife. And we stood in front of the grave of Peter Dunov in a garden in Sofia in Bulgaria. Um, and I can, I'm, getting, so I'm getting goosebumps even now just talking about that. Um, and so I, I have, um, but it's not, I've never, I've never felt I was one with the universe. Uh, you no, know, which a lot of people describe, and maybe that will happen to me, but it hasn't happened yet. What's the range of experiences that went into this book that that your colleagues have talked about? Um, well, I suppose you know there are two very broad orientations or types of mystical experience. There's there's mystical experience which W. T. Stace calls introverted. In other words, they it's it's the inner world and then the extroverted nat nature experience is more sort of a gertian experience if you like and and that's people feeling oneness with with nature with life with a tree with animals and with other people and um, but the the key in both cases is this sense of undivided wholeness and oneness Mm -hmm. And that you, you're not separate. The life that's in you, the mind that's in you, is continuous um, with life, with the one life and one mind. So that's that's really what it's about. And so it overcomes any sense of separation, which the ego is constituted by. I mean, the ego is a sense of separation. And and you, if you're only operating from the ego um, in a materialistic society, and um, then um, everything is is organized around that around your ego um, or the ego of your family or the ego of your your nation or your company or whatever it is and um, and that in in the long run that simply isn't satisfying 
and and so I see the 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 deep purpose of life is to re recover this sense of oneness and that we actually already are yeah. and and it's what um the new thought thinker thomas trowett he he called it self recognition yeah. capital s as it were said that About you recognize yourself right the you, know, you recognize the self. self as in fact the self mm -hmm. also jung used the same kind of terminology so the small self is actually essentially the large self and the large self expresses itself through the small self and that's 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 the transformative insight because it means that you and i are not separate beings we are interconnected interdependent beings uh, expressing the same life and the same consciousness and really to be healthy isn't it that we need that mindset we need to understand that we're part of a whole working as a whole i mean the proverbial cancer cell that goes rogue because it feels cut off from supply chains in the body so it creates its own and and uh kind of goes mad i mean that that seems to be the path that we're on today so well i've i've written a book about the life review and and its implications um, both the life review in near-death experiences and the life review in post-mortem reports of the same experience oh tell us um, about plus, that you know plus the the, the spiritual teachers like Steiner and Peter Dunoff, what they say about it. Right. And so the, the, in my analysis, there are two, this happens to about 10 to 15 percent of NDEers. And in my analysis, and I think Kenneth Ring, and you know, whose book I was reading um, last week, his new book, um, would agree um, that there's what, what I'd call panoramic memory, which is simply an unemotional um, you know, cinema screen of your experiences. And then there's a life review proper, which is when you experience multidimensionally mm -hmm. um, the effects or how a particular event was experienced by everybody who was having the experience. And so um, this call, different experiences um, of this event, which is this meeting that we're having, and if you were to understand this event in all its dimensions, then you'd have to you'd have to experience what it was like to be everybody else on the call. And that's the essence of the the deep life review. Is you experience what it was like to be the other people or other person um, that you uh, interacted as, with. Yes, indeed. People are describing so, that in a near death experience with their life review. Correct. Um, and it, if you start thinking about it, it has very profound implications because um, this would be logically impossible unless we are fundamentally connected in consciousness. Yeah. And, and I call this process empathetic resonance. In, in other words, you, you are resonating empathically or empathetically um, with someone else. And it is sensitive. I don't know if there was any um medical practitioners on the call but um it's possible for people to diagnose their patients by feeling in their own system um what's wrong with them i happen um, to know we have a medical intuitive in the audience so that's right. so similar yeah uh, and so this 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 has profound ethical implications it's what i call an ethic of interconnectedness because if you know um that everything the effects of everything you do are going to be re-experienced by you um, when you go over to the other side. Um, then it's it's quite a sobering thought. Um, but of course, it has both positive and negative sides. So all the wonderful things that we do for other people, you'll experience those. And the not so great things, um, you'll experience those. And, and that's a learning process. And the way that Peter Dunoff summarizes this um, he said that when you go into the invisible world, you will be examined on the law of love. Mm. You will be examined on the law of love. Uh, and I was talking to my son about this because he he was asking me, well, what is it you do, Dad? You know, what's this all about? <laughs> um, and he was very struck by that particular phrase that you will be examined on the law, how you've applied the law of love. Um, and I think that's a beautiful way of putting it, because I think that acquiring a capacity to love and a capacity for wisdom 
is in my view what life's really all about and isn't it a learning curve so it's really not about punishment as in karma but this opportunity to keep learning i mean the universe yes, if, I, if it I, operates on I, the I, law of love then it's operating and loving all of us and bringing all of us into the fold no, I, I agree with that. And, um, but I think that that's exactly what the review is about, um, yeah. that it's a learning experience, um, that once you take on board um, this fundamental insight that we are each other, and mm -hmm. therefore we should apply the golden yeah. rule. I mean, if that was taught in schools, um, you know, if that was thought, that became the operating system um, of the world that we are each other therefore we should always be applying the golden rule and the world be a very different place because the the all the conflicts and wars that we're seeing and we have seen throughout history are, are really on the premise that there's there's the leaders are thinking well there's only one life i just got to make the most of it <laughs> um, and it doesn't really matter if i kill tens of thousands of people it doesn't really it really doesn't just you know uh, there'll be no consequences to to, to face up to but because you know you're extinguished to death anyway so right right just go right. for it um i we operate under the premise that we can only be healthy when all of us are healthy and um and that we need to honor the physical world as well as the spiritual world so that means our physical bodies that means mother earth that means the physical has a beauty and it's sacred as well right and it is imbued with spirit so we need to take care of um, all of it. You've described, um, you've, well, well, two questions. Number one is how are you and your colleagues going about putting some science to bring this to light? And then what will the world look like in your estimation if we did have the full equation? If we do have um, science and spirituality not with, without this divide? when we acknowledge that there's more to this reality, we will we will be able to transform ourselves and the world. What will that look like? So those two questions. And I also wanted to say, don't oversimplify the term science because there's so, there's so many different aspects to what science is. There's so many, right. yeah, there's so many different aspects. I mean, we've had this conversation with Tony Hull, an astrophysicist, and saying no, astronomy doesn't look at it that way as some other sciences do. They're very open-minded. They want to discover the unknown more so. And so I, I just wanted to be careful not to always put science in a little box that it's all the same thing. It's not all the same thing. And there are those scientists like 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 uh, we're talking about today that are pushing that envelope to go to the beyond, to, to help that discovery process happen. But back to your question. Yes, there are many different sciences, absolutely. Um, and um, but it's the you know, the physicists of a hundred years ago, um, they they were realizing the primacy of consciousness or the fundamental nature of consciousness. And you know, Max Planck, Schrödinger, mm -hmm. um, Wolfgang Pauli, um, James Jeans, um, a lot of them expressed this view um that without consciousness and the capacity for consciousness there's no science there's nothing and and it's it's it still hasn't that message still hasn't really got through right. and and the the 1931 interview with max planck um, in in the observer where this fundamental nature of consciousness he states it in so many words and says the mind is the matrix of matter and and you know, as I say, and Schrodinger is another particularly good example of this. And then Pauli worked with C.G. Jung um, on on synchronicity. Yeah. Um, but the the um, as I say, I don't see the problem with is so much with science as with the philosophy of science and the assumptions that underpin science. Right. And so the scientific method. Um, you know, which it gets adapted by different disciplines. You don't have the same one in astronomy as you do in neuroscience. Um, the scientific method, but this open, the combination of openness and systematic uh, approach, um, rigor, uh, experiment, and so on. Um, this is this is something that you know can be applied um, across the board. Um, mm -hmm. But um, consciousness is not out there. It's in here. 
right yeah. right and, and so it's to the think underpinning can, of it all yeah yeah to think that you can treat consciousness just in the same way as you treat everything else um is a is a category error um what you can do is investigate the brain and and the relationship between the brain and consciousness and this has been done um you know very systematically for for 100 years and we're still you know we're still going on at that um and so i i i see the the issue is is the materialism in science and the physicalism the naturalism in science which is closed off from the kind of experiences we've been talking about right and almost like the dogma the dogma of science a little bit it is it's a dogma and if you don't think i mean someone like rupert sheldrake um is a very good example because he is a you know one of the cleverest people in the world in my view mm -hmm. and he's he's trained in biochemistry you know he has double first from cambridge he was a fellow of clare college cambridge he's a research fellow of the royal society <laughs> and yeah. he studied history and philosophy of science at harvard yeah um, and he has an amazing intellectual pedigree but he's what they call a heretic oh yeah. very much we've interviewed him <laughs> no, yeah. because he he doesn't think um for instance then there as i've got his books behind me he doesn't think for instance that consciousness is generated by the brain and he says there's a lot of evidence that it isn't right and um, and so the i i did, what i find challenging and this is i've been thinking about this just this afternoon is how to highlight this 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 issue um and get scientists to think think it through um, and realize that you can't actually do science without having a philosophy. Mm. It's impossible. Yeah, yeah. Um, you have you to know, have some basic assumptions yeah, and premises. You have to have basic assumptions, uh, axioms, presuppositions. Mm -hmm. And what what the there was an Oxford philosopher called uh, Robin Collingwood, and he wrote a book called Essay on Metaphysics in um, 1940, and he said that all science begins with a question and the question contains a presupposition or more than one presupposition so let's just look at our the subject of our conversation which is consciousness so the hard problem um, is sometimes defined as how does the brain produce consciousness mm. not does the brain produce, produce consciousness but how does how? the brain the assumption, produce yeah. consciousness? and so the assumption is actually embedded in the very asking or formulation of the question and that's really what i'm getting at um, and that's what william james was getting at this is 125 years ago i mean how is it that we haven't got it and it's taken right. 125 years to be thinking in exactly the same way as james was criticizing we uh we keep coming up against the universe is conscious and we're just a transmitter receiver not transmitter we're receiver we're just receiving right, right? we can open our bandwidth mm. a little bit further so you want you asked the second question was what would the planet be like oh yeah go there um, yes if uh if this realization were generally understood and i would include in that realization what i've just been describing um which is a, a knowledge of this in this radical fundamental interconnectedness of mind and consciousness which means that we are each other which means that we need to treat each other in that way and yeah. this is the ethic of interconnectedness and so if you if you do this thought experiment um then everybody would be looking after everybody else and not just you, humans but the whole web of no the and the, and the planet and the you know but because and any kind of short-term um policy which which was which you know profited the few but you know was costing the many a lot um that would be unthinkable because you know you the, if you also believe that uh, the planet is a living planet um that there's this is the one life you see that's why i'm talking about one life because yeah. there isn't more than one type of life there's life and and the same with consciousness there's consciousness and there's mind and consciousness, which is why I I find very congenial this um, notion, which was put forward by the New Thought thinkers 120 years ago, of a universal mind. 
-hmm. And I think that's what people are experiencing in mystical experience. They're realizing that they are the universal mind. And what is that in Western um, uh, terminology? It's gnosis. Gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S. And this is a Greek term for direct knowing that you are the universe. Right. That, that, that you that your, your awareness is the awareness of the universe and, and this is this is i mean rupert spira has been you know going on and on about this as well it's just this is you know one example and so this this really needs to be uh, conveyed in our educational systems but then the teachers need to understand it first otherwise they won't be able to teach it um it's interesting to me how readily the general public embraces these ideas when you have alternate methods of delivering them. For example, the huge blockbuster Avatar series is really describing a world in which the population understands it's part of it. That's its philosophy. They describe, here's the death process. You become one with that Gaia, um, Pandora, whatever. And, um, And so we embrace these ideas, do we not? We embrace, you know, the the Jedi Knight. Know this and operate on this. We can embrace this in sci-fi. We can embrace this in our direct experience. Our whole institutes um, founded on the fact that we have ready access to this, and our ancient ancestors knew this and had rituals to open that bandwidth and directly experience that. So we all know this and we all live it. And I, I guess I'm asking. What steps is the Galileo Commission taking? You you mentioned your seminars, your discussions. Are you having, are you, do you have techniques for direct experience? The experiential this? aspect of it. Do people each <clears throat> have their own spiritual practice? Do they wait for spontaneous no, mystical we, experiences? That's well, what I had as a child really, that woke me up spontaneously. Uh-huh. Um, we're, not, we're not really in the business of telling people how to experience things or what to experience. You're just supporting it when you have. Yes. Um, this is an intellectual uh, but, idea to embrace it, feel safe with it. Well, and Start society with it. But it's look, it's no, there's a vast evidence base, and and behind me I've got um, the three volumes from the University of Virginia: Irreducible Mind, Beyond Physicalism, and Consciousness Unbound. Um, you, you're probably familiar. Maybe the, the the listeners are also familiar with these volumes. But you know, if you read these volumes thoroughly, um, then you can't come to any other conclusion than con- consciousness is a fundamental reality um, in the universe, and and that the 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 idea that the brain is simply is the, the only response is responsible for the generating consciousness simply doesn't add up. So it's quite the what we're trying to do is um, with individual, the Galileo report already goes into this question and that there are different versions of it that your listeners can have a look at. There's the main 128 page report mm-hmm. with 20 pages of academic references. Then there's a summary report, which is you know, 25 or 30 pages. And then there's a layman's report, which puts it into ordinary language. Oh, thank you. Um, for that. There's a summary of two pages yeah. So if you're really pushed, and we have the summary in 14 languages, um, you can get, you can go to the GalileoCommission.org site and you can read the summary of the argument. Yeah, and, and so that's sort of a good point of departure. Um, and then I think what we're what we're going to move into as as one of the project going forward, um, is what we're calling consciousness education. And and this is being led by a couple of university colleagues. Um, who are collaborating and and have got some seed funding just to get the process going. And so this will be one of our activities. And then we'll also be asking the question, what is wisdom in science? Mm -hmm. Um, Because our our advisor... What about knowledge? We have knowledge, we have wisdom. How do you define it? Well, yeah, humanity is now too clever to do without wisdom. Um, was oh, oh that's a beautiful statement humanity is now too clever as in dangerous was what knowledge we yeah, have exactly. to do without the wisdom tempered by wisdom. a spiritual basis and and mm. experience yeah yeah well this 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 is a theme worth just exploring in a bit more detail because um ravi ravindra who you may know and um, he's the emeritus professor of comparative religion and physics 
um, at Dalhousie University in Canada. <clears throat> and he would be an excellent guest for your, your you. conversations here. Uh, he says, what we need is wise scientists. Thank you. Um, and uh, so how, and I think he's he's a good example. You know, he's a very wise scientist. Uh, because if if scientists are not wise, then um, they get involved in all sorts of um, research. Um, and they don't try to, you know, questionable research. And, and they don't try to work on themselves. You know, to refine their own consciousness, to think about their values and priorities, and 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 if you if you asked you know if you put a wisdom quotient against um, you know scientists in general, and um, you'd find that they're very very clever people. Uh, a yeah. lot of them, I mean, Ian McGilchrist yeah. would say, their left hemispheres are extremely well developed, but the right hemispheres <laughs> not doesn't seem to be engaged. Yeah, um, and the right point. hemisphere is the, is the hemisphere of feeling. It's the mm -hmm. hemisphere of intuition, of imagination, mm -hmm. and 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 these two need to work together. Um, Ian's great book, which came out two years ago, is called "The Matter with Things," um, and and um, he's one of the most important thinkers on the planet. Uh, you know, with respect to these matters of consciousness, but also culture. And because our culture has been captured by this left hemisphere, analytical, detached, controlling, manipulative thinking, and and that needs to change. The matter with matter. Um, is that for me? It's not just what science is saying; it's fundamental premises, but it's also what the oligarchs of today and the techno te technocrats are doing mm. and so you have you know this rise of ai do we really want this do we yeah, sure, you're yeah. going to go out and colonize mars do, really is that a smart idea right now how about taking care of this planet first and uh you mentioned transhuman oh oh yeah let's make robotic humans that can that can defy death in the material sense um so i wonder what they're doing and what is the premise of what we think oh. of as forward progress where are we going? Do we all agree on this? How are we spending the world's resources? Right. How are you spending uh, the economy? Who's getting to decide <laughs> where we're going? Shouldn't yeah. it be a conversation for all of us? We're all uh, stakeholders in this. Yeah. So I worry about that as well. Your thoughts? Absolutely. Um, and I think, again, I think you've got left hemisphere capture. Um, and ego, you know, hubris, the, yeah, yeah, and ego and hubris and all the rest of it, and the World Economic Forum program and approach you know, embodies this, in my view. But you know, what I want to do is just go back a step because, again, we're talking about what is a human being. Yeah. So, so we, we, I would maintain, and the network um, members would mainly maintain um, that we are spiritual beings with a transcendent dimension. And that we're evolving and learning, um, you know, as such beings. But the the technocrat transhumanists are scientific materialists, espoused to or based on scientism, which is the ideology of science, not science itself. And they they either assume that we are complex biological machines, right? That's one model. Yeah. Or if you're Yuri, Yuri, um, no, no, I'll. Harari, Yuval Noah Harari, then you're a hackable animal. Um, and so the humans are hackable animals, and the and the oligarchs are, are doing their best to, to hack into us with the fourth industrial revolution, transhumanism, and the merging of the human and the machine, of yeah, which the right. AI development is a part. And so this I'm going to be talking exactly about this on Tuesday, um, you know, because my title. Um, will be um, you know, the future of humanity, um, transcendence or transhumanism. Mm -hmm. and, and so so what the, the transhumanists think that their track is actually the next stage of evolution, that the merging of the That's human what they're and the pitching. Yeah. is the next stage of evolution. And it will make us cleverer, even cleverer than we already are. But will it make us wiser? No, yeah. absolutely not. Um, and so we we need to recover. And I've been I've been reviewing a book, an amazing book today, um, by 
um, a, a philosopher geometer called Tom Bree, B R W -E, E, and it's called the Cosmos in Stone. Uh, and it's about sacred geometry in Wells Cathedral, but it's also about the ascent of the soul, the evolution of the soul, and um, the, the, the way that the cathedral actually mirrors this whole process. And what you realize when you read the book is that we've forgotten um, this. Um, this Greek heritage, this sacred Greek heritage, um, you know, which is embodied in the seven liberal arts. Uh, and so that the important thing is actually to develop your human capacities. Um, and then you can, you know, go into more specialist activities. But we're not focusing in our education really on the, the development of what's truly human about us. You know, I appreciate the validation that you've given my whole quest in life. Because <laughs> um, I started out as a little child having spontaneous mystical moments where I could only conclude, I'm not crazy, the world is. And these adults that are raising me, these adults in society, they don't even have the answers, let alone the right questions. So that was my first premise. My first, I hosted yeah. a radio show for many years where the premise was, who are we? Where did we come from? Where are we going? And what's it all about? We need to, this is a quest that we're each of us on. And this is a sacred quest to answer these questions. And I guess my point is that that was just built in to my life. I suspect that is built into all of our lives. And that really one of the joys of life is to go out and have this hero's journey, each of us, and go explore and go discover and go figure it out. If and the world does a very good job of allowing us to do that, right? The world is okay the way it is. I don't think we need to, I don't think we need to, the The vision for these, the vision for humanity and where we're going, I don't see that it's answering that quest any better than what we already have. Doesn't it still come right? down to consciousness? So I don't think still... we need to merge with machines to be smarter. Right. or better, right. or well, extend I, I'm very suspicious of the word smart, actually. I know that in, yeah. in the U.S. it means intelligent, um, but it, it has a more technical sense. Oh, the um, smart machines and the smart, smart machines, devices, smart and machines, the that our house is you know, smart. Smartphones, yeah. um, and, and the, what it, it's a digitization um, process. You. That we're not um, enough, we have to rely on no, our and, and, no, to so be that, That's why us. I keep on talking yeah. about wisdom yeah um, so in, in english language uh, to be smart is to be clever um but what i'm saying is that particular concept has been taken over with with new connotations mm -hmm. and so everything and i've just actually reviewed um a um a book on smartness um you know which is coming up in my next issue of the journal and and he the the part of the argument is that the word smart is almost epistemological um, that is a way of seeing the world. And, and it's assumed that the smarter, the better. And, and that there's no reason why we shouldn't be going full steam ahead, you know, to having 50 minute smart cities. And, and that absolutely baked, all this is baked into the UN 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. And if you look at the work of someone like Patrick Wood, um, you'll realize that that these two uh, these two things the development of cities and and the sustainable development goals so called are part of the same equation um and you really need to look under the bonnet um to understand what these are about and how they're being used oh could um i've been looking at the un um uh, inner development goals that looked pretty ah. good mm, that's Please, i do yeah. I have come across those, yes, and um, and no, I like the, I like that approach, um, but I think you know the, there's a lot of very anodyne, good sounding um, vocabulary around, you know, the inclusive language, the 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 ex something for all, quote unquote, um, and so it it sounds wonderful. Um, but you have to look at the detail of what it actually means, you know, before what are the arriving, arriving at any conclusions exactly. And and I I recommend the work of Ian Davis, um, Ian with two eyes, 
Davis, D-A-V-I-S, um, and Whitney Webb, um, as well as Patrick Wood, um, who writes every day you get technocracy news. Um, and so there are three articles that he'll he posts yeah. every day. I, I read a lot of these yeah. and yeah. it really keeps you up to speed with these these technocratic developments. Well, I use the smart uh, I use the term smart in that new context because I don't know that we need to be enhanced in that way. And if you start to enhance humans with this technology or oh here, Outer. here's an embryo, parents. How do you want to enhance this child's genes before they're even developed? Right? It's gonna to come to that, um, as stated in this article I read. And I'm like, oh, then that's just gonna be the elite get to do that. You're gonna have a you're gonna have more class um, divisions. You're, you're just really going to divide us. You're going to have the haves and the really have nots. I mean, wh what is this doing to us? So I, I don't, I don't know that that's the direction we really want to go when it's just, oh, hey, let's go, let's trash earth. It's gone. Let's go create another colony on ours. And only those rich enough to buy the ticket can go there. So, I mean, what are we looking at? More division, more divisiveness. You know, this is actually potentially a form of new eugenics. Yeah. You know, where you they and the whole idea, you know, what's being enhanced um, is our left hemisphere capacity. And so we're we're not we're not. Is anybody wanting to be enhanced for compassion? You yeah. know, for empathy. Thank you. That's what that's what that's what we need to enhance. Uh, the, right. Yeah. The, the, Albert Schweitzer had a had a wonderful phrase where he said um, that we want what's our our task is to become more finely and deeply human, more finely and deeply human, and live and, a richer life. Yes, yeah. and that, and that means the... that means that means yeah. that love and wisdom are your operating system. Truth is your operating system. System, yeah. Joy creativity yes joy experience. peace these are the these are these are what these yeah. are the then these are virtues or human qualities human you know, flourishing which, yeah in flourishing i mean there's you get it all in you know from you know, aristotelian virtue ethics and, and the and the idea of flourishing was that the by which is eudaimonia in in greek um is that you 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 would be um happier uh, also by doing good mm. by doing good so doing good and and you know pursuing the good the beautiful and the true enables you or ensures that you become happier and then you make a better contribution to the world mm -hmm. you leave the world a better place than than when you arrived and that right there we all have the capacity for it and that right there is what we can do well, to truly create the world that we all want to live in mm -hmm. i just i just want to say that um a friend of mine said something very wise about the whole UFO phenomenon. And she said, you know, it really, I look at it as what are these projected aliens story telling us about ourselves? And she said, for me, the gray aliens, this sort of image of the, um, these, these gray aliens, the huge head and no body and no physicality. And she goes, is that who we want to become? Because that's a projection. All of this is a projection of attributes of ourself. These are mm -hmm. archetypes that really reflect who we are. Mm -hmm. I thought, how brilliant, you know, how brilliant. And, and like, what is the trajectory of, of humanity? Um, I think there's a lesson to be learned in just what we're saying with the stories that we tell ourselves and the world around us. Do you want to open it up to say yeah, something? Let's open it up to our audience and say, well, what questions would you like to pose this community, David? Yes. Um, um, well, what can I just come back on the, on the UFO issue um, okay. briefly? Um, and that's that the that's what that's the sort of view that Jung took, and he wrote an essay in 1956 on on UFOs, uh, and, and from a sort of psychological point of view. And, yeah. I, and I do think that's I do think that's part of it. And I also think that the, you know, the top retired military, naval, and air force people, they all say that the that this is real, you know. Yeah. That yeah. While they're in office, they don't dare say that sort of thing because you're not supposed to say it. Um, but when they retire, they can actually come out and uh, tell. They've, and they've been as restricted as you scientists and telling right. their own truth. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. They, we we were thinking about 
uh, setting up retired scientists for wider experience or something like that because you know if you're <laughs> retired they can't get at you any longer um and i think that the for me um the person the go-to person in this whole field is dr stephen greer yeah. um, and, and he has been um, involved in this for decades um, and he also understands the intelligence aspects of this and the military aspects um, and the 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 possibility um, and i'm just flagging this up as a possibility um, and i've no way of knowing whether this is going to happen but there could be a false flag operation um you know to frighten us mm. um, and i think that i think this whole area where there's subdue um, and submission yeah well and so stephen greer makes this point he says that there are there are different forms of of craft in inverted commas um there's the real thing quote unquote but there's also the there's also what's being worked on with DAR by DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, um, and it's I think that this technology is probably far more advanced than than they're prepared to let on, um, and I think it muddies the waters quite a lot um, if you're talking about interdimensional um, capacities. And um, oh. that and so he said he says you need you need to ask yourself a question you know what is the exact nature of, of what you're seeing um, and of course it may be hard to tell um but i just said I, I think things are i think things are um you know gradually coming out but at the same time i'm very suspicious of um these this field being used as yet another reason for more military expenditure Right. That's exactly what we don't need. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you have the question, what is the nature of us species that we actually do this to one another, mm. right? Keep pulling the wool over each other's eyes. And maybe back to the original discussion and that of yeah. consciousness itself and, and not being Pollyanna, but trying to find some some of the understandings of like, we're, how do we solve some of the dilemma that we're building for ourselves as a humanity? And it does it come down to just that that some sort of a shift? There's always been some sort of a, a thing, like whether you go back to the, the Vedic traditions or the different traditions around the world showing that humanity has to find some source, something that that makes a shift that it's not just done intellectually. It's not well, I think just it's done... been finding us over and over again. That's why this is a perennial question. Right. So that question yeah. keeps coming up. And so, um, you know, there there has to be something there. The universe isn't going to let us go easily. Right. And so that's throwing us a lifeline. So that's my well, point. I'd like to bring in the sacred feminine here. Oh, good idea. Um, Yay. Um, and oh, this man. is, you know, some of this work has been done by my great, great friend, um, Anne Baring. Mm. Um, you know, the dream of the cosmos. I'm getting quite the guest <laughs> list from you. I'm just yeah, taking the notes. Yeah, the myth of the goddess. Yeah. Um, and and the, the it's the soul dimension and um, the feminine dimension the earth dimension the body dimension the sexuality right. dimension this is what needs to come into balance because our 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 systems especially with respect to power um are run by by masculine archetypes if you like by mask by by m militaristic individualistic self-interested right. um, right. people and and we're, we're also being run by people who've made a great deal of money and then they put it out through their philanthropic foundations and then they buy influence with the money right um, bill gates is maybe the best example of of this um because then you get to set the agenda um when you put enough funding into particular areas so i think we need a we need absolute wholesale revolution um, mm. in agriculture in technology in communications oh, yeah. in food and in health uh, and everything needs to be based on regeneration and healing and, and those and very that's goddess the principles of the divine feminine. That yeah, you... exactly. And by the way, you mentioned a lot of men in your organization. Where are the women? <laughs> well, I'm, I I mentioned the men because um, the network was actually founded by men. Um, and, but we have um, a lot of women on our program. Oh, wonderful. And we have, um, the, 
the Galileo Commission steering group, um, I think, has four, uh, well, will have four women and three men on it. Um, and so we're we're very keen to um, you know, really, you know, pr well, promote the intuitive, the imaginative, um, the receptive, the you know, the feminine aspects, but in balance with the masculine. And so it's, it's it's not the feminine principle is not the answer. It, it's part of the answer. And indeed, I'm very suspicious of um, the very terminology problem and solution or question and answer, because um, this reflects a, a framing and actually a linear thinking. And so what's the solution to global warming, quote unquote? Oh, well, it's carbon neutrality. It's carbon reduction. It's greenhouse gases. Um, and Charles Eisenstein points out this is a reductionist, linear reductionist approach, which doesn't respect the, the complexity of the Thank ecosystems you. involved. Or or our whole dig a little deeper. How, yeah, well, how, I think Charles Eisenstein is yeah. is one of the great thinkers on the planet. Um, and and uh, along with Ian McGill, <laughs> you know, they've just had a conversation together. And then Gene Houston. Yeah. You know, what would you like to fund? Well. So you mentioned, you know, those who have made the wealth get to decide what to fund and what are you growing in terms of research questions or programs. What would you like to see funded? What would you do? Well, I think there's a I'm, I'm sort of going to slight, skirt around the question slightly because um, I went to the coronation um in London at the beginning of May. And in fact, I, I one of my books is about the then Prince of Wales. And um, and um I was having a I was at a street party on the Sunday and I was having a conversation with a hedge fund manager. And he said, Oh, we're we're investing in the environment. Um and so I thought, great, well, but what are you investing in? He's really investing in technological innovations that could have some environmental effect um, and i said to satish kumar this week what they need to be investing in is regenerative agriculture mm. it's small farmers it's local markets but there's no return on that there's only return on big money investment for technological innovation and development and i see this as a systemic problem um, because the the direction we're facing in and the idea that big interventions, more technology is the quote solution very um, to the very problems, um, yeah. problems that that have been created by the very same mindset. Thank you. Uh, yeah. That's and, my and also view. it's keeping the power centralized mm -hmm. as opposed yeah. to diversified. And you know, this 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 exercises me a lot. Um, because, um, you know, Irvin Laszlo and I have got a book coming out um, called um, The Great Upshift. Um, this, this oh, is, I like that. The Great uh, Upshift. The Great Upshift. This is, Irvin has got um, a current book out. Um, but this is a multi-author book with an incredible array uh, of thinkers. So we're co-editors of this book. And and you can have all these wonderful initiatives, and 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 grounds ground up grassroots and all of that, um, but how how this can come through in view of the the power structure and the fact that the corporate um, keep the World Economic Forum represents the richest companies in the world, and um, and these are the very companies who bought the governments and bought the politicians. Mm -hmm. and set the agenda and 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 they pharmaceuticals is part of this and it might shock you to know that among the senators and um rep house of representatives candidates um in 2020 72 percent received donations from the pharmaceutical companies oh uh, yeah percent i mean that uh that has uh, you know that tells you something about political power and political yeah. influence and so the these are all these forces are keeping the current system in play yeah. um and that that's and i talk you know satish and i were talking about his book radical love this week and 
the whole approach of resurgence um, and the ecologists and the environmental people who understand the environmental movement is yeah. decentralization, localization, individualization, mutual aid, looking after each other, not top down surveillance and control and manipulation. But empowering all of us. Correct. To... Yeah. Um, and then... How do you, that's the question. Um, how, how do you, I, mean, I suppose the answer is that the, this top down centralized system has to collapse um before um we can bring something new and humane in i don't know you know it's not very comfortable this whole mm. whole well, scenario okay um, but i mean what if there were just ways for all of us to start to embrace this in more practical ways heartfelt ways and what if it was about the media um and and some of the what we the stories that we tell each other. I go back to storytelling. I'm My sorry. nephew was uh, really big on Sim City, so he had a game, and this is like decades old Sim City, where you get to try out different influences and see what happens. What if what if a new program was written, where a game like this, where it was about what is the goal for harmony and equality and empowerment and diversity biodiversity um all of this i mean can't we we have the science we have the knowledge to understand all of this what if something was written with heart where these were the goals and you were rewarded for creating mm -hmm. a way i mean can we think about it can we play a game well, I'm, get I'm, ourselves I'm, wrapped I'm, up yeah. in these values and see the effects i mean if this okay. was yeah Something well, that I'm our glad to say that this is, this is actually happening. Oh, um, okay. Anna Lou, Anna Lou Smitsman, um, who's written the Earthwise Constitution, um, oh. her project, she's going to be talking about this on our platform in, in October, okay. and she's, she's looking for funding um, for a game um, which will engage people in exactly what we're talking about here. And okay. the there are two to three billion gamers in the world population. Exactly, and they're and they're all the, about death and destruction and yeah. war and conquering. And the, Can we change the, market, the game? Yeah, that's right. The market is current market is three hundred and eighty five billion dollars a year. That's the gaming video gaming market. Yeah, uh, and so to put a, a a a positive, creative product into this marketplace, I think is an incredibly important move. Um, I and I've been, been, I've been trying to get hands. support yeah. and they for it they're via noetic sciences um and no and I think I think Anna Luce's work um with Earthwise Constitution Earthwise generally is is amazing and she's written a trilogy with Jean Houston um who is oh, one of the okay I came across pages. that the other day mm. yeah right so yes I think uh I think we you know, that's part of the tools. And of course, you know, what we can do individually um, in our own areas of mutual support, mutual aid, helping each other and so on, that's all important. Um, but it's not going to change the power structures, the economic and political power structures. And I think there's there are well, there are two candidates. But in it the US would president. float hope that there's a way forward. And then we could start to understand what it takes and and just integrate that, right? We need to have a. Well, I, I was going to say that you've rather got, than you've... just tear everything down, isn't there? Can't we just have, aren't there enough cracks in the system, and where we can see a way forward, but embrace it and understand the the vision for each of us? Well, yes, and I what I was going to say is that the, you've got two candidates in the. Um, in the presidential election, um, Marilyn, Marianne Williamson and, and uh, Bobby Kennedy, um, who are putting forward the kind of who who got the who understand the level of systemic corruption, mm. um, which we one of the things we've been talking about, and and who have policies which would which would dismantle um, some of the and the regulatory capture. Um, the 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 fund the you know political funding um, structures and so on. Right. I mean, it may well be that you know, that you no know, the business as usual candidates um, will will get in, but I'm just talking about the Democratic candidates right. um, at the moment. Uh, and they've certainly they that two people 
and Denis Kucinich before them, and, and yeah. Denis was a presidential candidate in 2008 and 2012. Mm -hmm. um, these are people who understand spirituality and politics, uh, and they understand the bigger vision. Um, and so obviously there are personality issues and, you know, people on this call will have very different views and may have very strong views against or for, you know, one of the people I've been talking about. But, but I think they, I think the presidential election next year in the US is incredibly important. And if we get more of the same. Yeah. Um, then we'll get more of the same. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, they, it's, it's really, yeah. I mean, we did a game changer. Okay, yeah, we don't talk about politics here because like it's an endless uh but yeah. we talk about ideas and we talk about philosophy and we talk about values, right? Yeah. What would you like to ask our community and what would they like to ask you? Yeah, and I could open yeah. it up to questions and comments. Yeah, I think you should do that. I think we should open it up to uh to people's right. questions. Okay. Um, and I'll just check if there's I know who I want to start with. Yeah. I want to start with Fred Smith. Oh, Fred Fred is our Vedic scholar contributor. <laughs> deep into philosophy. Yeah. He's deep a into professor of, yeah. of Vedic philosophy. Hello. Uh, yeah. Hi, no, I'm, Fred. I'm a retired academic. I was I taught at the University of Iowa for 30 years. Um uh, basically uh Indian religion, uh comparative religion, Sanskrit language, that sort of thing. And deeply engaged in, in translations. From Sanskrit. I think there's parts of your, I mean, I, I enjoyed everything I've heard. Um, and I'm, I've learned a lot. I've taken notes and got different authors and like that, uh, some of whom I knew about and some of whom I didn't. And uh, um, I was thinking during some earlier parts of your talk that um, I was, I was, it goes through my mind about what is it from what I do that seems to juxtapose or complement or or look at slightly in the same way that that, that you do and Galileo uh, commission apparently uh which I'm going to plus start following um, yeah we do sign up as a professional affiliate because you know that's what it's for oh okay um and uh, professional affiliate all right I've got it open here um and um I was thinking about like when we were talking about the nature of consciousness and 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 so on that the way that at least they would look at it in in Indian philosophy, including both uh, of course so-called Orthodox or and Buddhist philosophy, that um, that uh, the um, and I was also thinking about um, a, a friend of mine here in Santa Fe, my my main hiking buddy in my retirement. Um, is a retired astrophysicist who was deeply engaged in 20 years. He was the math guy for SETI, for example, and uh, worked at NASA Ames as math guy. And um, the uh, um, what he said to make a really long story into like 12 easy words or less, um, <laughs> that life and consciousness are really in his view, and he, he studies like the, the evolution of galaxies, okay? <laughs> um, that uh, there was a, an imbalance shortly after the Big Bang between positive and negative um, uh, particles. And nobody quite knows how that happened, but there seemed to be this slight imbalance. And because of this slight, if, there was no, if it was perfectly balanced, there never would have been a universe. But this tiny, tiny micro imbalance allowed for it all to be created, including consciousness. But that um, uh, once and the individual, a lot of individuality happened, life forms and so on, that consciousness was a pervasive force, of course. But once it began to intermingle with what we goes on through our, our, own, our own biological and mentation processes, then there's um then we get these ideas about uh, about individuality about consciousness about the mixture of the two but what seemed to me what i was thinking was the the buddhist philosophy called chitamatra which means mind only or conscious or really thought only that the main meaning of nirvana 
which is literally blown out. And what is it in Buddhism that's blown out? It's blown out the idea that we can actually get to the bottom of any kind of um, understanding of process and get to the bottom of the origin of things through any kind of reasoning or thought processes. But that, um, uh, and what is blown out is the idea that we can get to a self through a process of deduction. We simply can't do it. So what is left then is thought only, chitta-matra, and um, that the, um, uh, and the consciousness, which is a pervasive force, which is way beyond any kind of way precedes our own our own self um is that there's our own whatever our own karmic uh development has resulted in then mixes is always there's always a relationship with this all-pervasive uh consciousness but it's not so in other words for us to be even thinking about consciousness there has to be a combination of our own individual development and that force which is way beyond us so the the question you know one of the questions the hard question um and it's interesting the, how societies early societies have been grappling this for so long right and now we've kind of taken a step back from even acknowledging this question it's interesting yeah, isn't it? yeah. yeah so, that, so that however we 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 see or perceive or think of of things today or even develop a question like what is consciousness where from does it arise we've been so at it for a long time that yeah. it's a combination it's not just something scientifically comes from our electrical impulses or something that is a result right. of our own higher states of consciousness but that but that our, our you know whatever momentary few minutes of of awakening that we've had like you described three occasions you have that that's always dependent upon this primeval, basically original force um, within the development of 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 the of the cosmos. Good point, and, and uh, David. Our son, yeah, our well, I mean, is clear enough about it. Well, I'm a Christian. Christian and understanding of that would be, you know, it, it's in God that we live and move and have our being. Mm -hmm. So that would be a that would be a different formulation of, of I think a similar approach that we uh, well Plotinus said it very nicely he said we are within a reality that is also within us mm -hmm. beautiful yeah that's they're both sort of saying the same thing but yeah I was kind of you know but then once we start using the word God then we get into all kinds of, of sticky yeah that, that's yeah. why I said it was a Christian formulation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, but but it, it's a but you're, so you're, there's a self there's a kind of self-reflexive element in in what you're saying, um, which I think is of the essence. And another way of putting it would be that we we live in a reciprocal relational um universe. Um and that deeply realizing this reciprocity and relationality um you know leads to empathy and understanding um which is a good outcome if you like over the process yeah yeah anyway i'm 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 going to read you now which one of your books or two of your books your most recent <clears throat> you well you the, <clears throat> this, this is a book of like essays that. which you <clears throat> which you might That's enjoy right. um, because it covers a lot of different areas okay. um and um, there's also the other book that we've just republished um, is, is Thinking Beyond the Brain. Oh. Um, there's, this, the, there's the new renaissance, um, which, which uh, uh, Jenny, uh, Laura pointed out at the beginning. And then we're republishing two other ones. One's called Wider Horizons, which came out in 1999. It was the 25th anniversary of the network. And then the other one is the Spirit of Science, which came out of the Mystics and Scientists conferences. But I'm, I'm still in the process of editing those, and um, hopefully they'll come out 
before the end of the year. And then my my book, my books on um, on um, survival uh, are a book called Survival question <clears> mark <throat> and then the ethical aspect of that is now called Resonant Mind, um, the near death experience and the ethic of interconnectedness, which I was talking a little bit about. And in terms of Indian philosophy, I have a lot of Radhakrishnan um, in my library. Um, he's someone who I um, think was an outstanding uh, life. For sure. Anyway. I also um, think that your acquaintance. Yeah. I also Thanks. think Thank that you. your Galileo Commission report Thank that you, you described earlier uh, is a good place to start too. I want to see what you say to the grassroots. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Fred. There's some interesting questions in the chat room. Rex Barker, could you turn on your camera and and microphone and ask your questions yourself rather than me reading them? That'd be great. Uh, anybody else want to raise their hand? They can also get in on the conversation with us. There you are, Rex. Rex. Yeah, I'd, I've been, uh, my recent reading, I've read actually, a phenomenal range of books so far at the moment from Aboriginal wisdom to physics. And Massimo Citro sort of really did explore for me this uh, this um, challenge between particles and fields. And when you sort of start talking, yeah, that's exactly it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, you know, that it's it really took me to the core of the issue that, uh, you know, a particle exists in time and space and a field is eternal. So therefore, ah, I like that. To, to, to observe Oh, sorry, to consider the particle, in a sense, you have to separate from the eternal. And therefore, you know, my question is, yeah, is this the paradox that we face? That um, mm. when we have a spiritual experience, sorry, I'm sorry, no, John, I can't work out what he's uh, doing. Uh, but when we, when we enter a spiritual or a, a non-ordinary state, my own experience is that there is no other. We are all that is. It's it's this eternal, yeah. which is very difficult then to put into to to share with anyone, because there's so much you need to in fact add to, to provide the context. So, for me now, the, the sort of issue seems to be fairly clear that, yet the as a particle. You know, consciousness arises when the particle emerges from the void, the eternal, you know, from eternity, and only then. Because when you go back into, when you're in an ordinary, ordinary state, i.e. you're in the field, right. then you can't conceive of separation, or you can't see, conceive of the individual. Both states and, are have their, their purpose. Yeah, so, there's a sort of... Um, I mean, there's the you can use the wave and particle metaphor here, yeah. Um, because there are part particular aspects of life and wave aspects of life, yeah. And and um, and I, I mean, I'm gonna. I I was actually looking at, at Citro's book this afternoon, reminding myself I must get him on our webinar platform, and um, yeah. because I was hugely impressed by the book which I reviewed a few years ago. And I need to revisit it to, um, you know, remind myself what it's all about. Um, but I think the one of the things you've been saying is um, is is talking about emergence, um, that when certain thing happens, then something else, consciousness emerges. Or, um, and I think that's only, I think that's part of the picture. But and I, what I'm reminded of is a, you know, Whitehead's philosophy in process and reality um where he he talks about the the prior and consequent nature of the divine um, and the prior is the transcendent and uh, effectively and the consequent is the imminent which is imminent in the evolutionary process mm -hmm. and 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 so you that from a transcendent perspective you'd say that consciousness is all pervasive um which would be brahma or uh, the uh, atman um but from the from the particle slash evolutionary perspective, you say, well, it emerges. Like the bones so I, implicate. I think, the, so I think both of these both of these propositions are probably true, um, but they aren't necessarily consistent with each other because reality is paradoxical. But, but this is I think this is the point there. And the fact that we are challenged by the fact that they are 
you know, that this this arises. Um, I just, you know, I, this is for me where science gets lost because in a sense, what it's looking for is to be able to define and clarify and really separate. And actually the thing is it can't do that because it exists in different form in both. I mean, it, it has to exist within the field as a percentage of potential and the fact that, yeah. it, that it does exist yeah. in in as a particle, because you know suddenly you've gone from an eternal to a moment in time and space, and I think and this I... is this is the challenge for people to get their head around, which is how could the two coexist? I and think so. it, it? yes, um, but I think that you know leading thinkers like McGilchrist are are. And I think Capra would say the same thing that the you know, relationality is primary. Um, it's not the things. That's why he's called the matter with things, um, because the thing is an abstraction, um, yeah. and that there are, and this is a field view as well. Relationality, in my view, corresponds to a field view, uh, and the field uh, everything is it everything is is within and arises within the field and disappears back into it i mean i, I have to say as a sailor i mean the idea of the ocean and then the wave on the ocean or the 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 piece of water that breaks away on the crest of a wave sort of i can really relate to that and and it's you know so yeah but it's it still doesn't allow me in a sense to resolve it Perfect. No, but I'm not sure it's it should be resolved. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I, yeah, I, I would agree. My most I mean, as, as Wilka said, we're here to live the questions rather than find the answers. Yeah, oh, interesting. Thank you, Thank Brax. You. That's I, good. I just I relate to that what you're saying in the sense of I find in my most mystical moments that it's about having one foot in this world simultaneously with another foot in this other realm, that we can bridge the two, that you can hold the void or eternity while you're that tiny point that you've this, expanded you're both at once so I, I just wanted to i just wanted to share i've had sort of several experiences one which where in fact normally when i go into a normal a non-ordinary state which i can never predict i find myself as if i'm i'm in the universe somewhere in a void there's nothing around me and i got used to the idea of being very calm when i'm there but on the last occasion, I was found myself in this space and a question was put to me. And the question was that if you were the soul of a planet, if you were the soul of a galaxy and you could offer it only a vision, knowing that that's all that would guide its development, what would you offer? And that really floored me because, and I think, you know, for me, this is part of it because within business, the way I've turned organizations around is to co-create with the directors a common vision, which allows people to express it in different ways, but the meaning is the same. Good point. And and it was some some that sort of felt rather like the same problem, you know. That how do you do it? Because infinitely more have to engage with, it, and it has to be meaningful to them. Thank anyway, you. That's, thank yeah, you. that's a lovely thought. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank appreciate you. that. Um, we wanted to also add Brian. Uh, Tucker into the conversation. Hello, Brian. Hey, hello, hello. I'm enjoying this conversation very much, uh, David, and appreciate the Galileo Commission's work and the medical and scientific network. There have been some excellent speakers and material that we've been able to uh, hear as a result of that effort. Um, I, I wanted to just ask a question about embodied spiritual practices. And if there is interest within the Galileo Commission, are there people taking up uh, the question of what practices might help um, as we move towards this state of open mind and open heart towards a transcendence. And Laura had referenced the inner development goals. There's a worldwide effort to compile what are the major ways we develop our inner capacities? Uh, what are recommended processes? Is that a question that's taken up? Uh, or have you have you examined that further? Yes, well, I practice it myself. Um, and the yes, I, I think embodied spirituality is is uh, is an area that we we could maybe um, open up as a, as a as a sort of further seam. But I mean the the network. Um, in fact, as we speak, um, at the moment, 
the members of the network are in a meditation session um, <clears throat> because that happens every every evening at six o'clock sorry every sunday evening at six o'clock um london time and there's usually between 80 and 100 members there and so it's like a sangha um if you like um, and peter fennick is the emeritus president and um, he gave the initial impulse for this and he's been meditating for 60 years uh, maybe even longer um, and 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 he was one of the first people in the 60s to do um neuroscience sorry um scientific studies and meditation you know by, by hooking people up to eeg including george harrison right. um, which was quite something right. and then i'll just say a little bit about my own um embodied practice because this comes from from peter dunoff the bulgarian who's some You've of the work on peter dunoff yeah. Yes. Um, there's there's a, a prophet for our times, and then I've also translated his prayers, and there's a book on panurhythmy, and the, the, what I do every morning are, are these exercises, you know, which have formulas um, with them. And so, just to give you an example, you you do you bring your hands like this down over your head, um, and and you you say to yourself, "May the blessing of God descend on my soul." And, and there, are, yeah. there are six. So if you want, look on YouTube under David Lorimer's six exercises. Um, you'll find that that I, they're there, um, and I, I, I demonstrated those in the U.S. in in 2016, and and those are, um, those really help me to orient and tune myself in the morning, and um, so I'm tuning my body. I, I meditate and pray um, every morning as well. Um, and and that uh, and this tuning of the body um, is, I think, something very very important. I try to keep myself, you know, very fit, um, and I do weights work and flexibility work um, every day. And you know, I'm 71, so you know, life life is you know continues on. And and I think when you're this kind of age, then keeping yourself in shape in every dimension that is very Mentally, important physically and spiritually, spiritually. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so what right. do you find a gesture why do you find that important and a ritual this is a ritual this is, is actually yes. asking well, the universe to come and and just yeah and, and you can feel it you can feel yeah, it absolutely. Uh, and, and so there's there's a very similar one at the end of the sequence um which when you um so you, the affirmation is i'm in harmony with living nature mm -hmm. and may the blessing may the blessings of god flow through me yeah and then i i, I, I my innovation to this is i i after that i send the blessing out in the four directions you know with my hand and um, because the, the hand do not teaches that the right hand is the emissive hand mm -hmm. and then the panurhythmy is a hugely more complex series of movements um which um 28 movements and the music itself was composed by dunoff mm. and so you can find that on youtube in fact i i just posted on my facebook page this week a, a two-minute video um of the panurhythmy in the Rila mountains last week very good yeah and brian we, um, go ahead, go ahead. Brian. No, I was just going to thank you. That's that's very helpful to hear. And um, we'll look we'll look into it more. I was going to say just in uh, what draws us into this community with Paul and Laura is the work of Felicitas Goodman and her emphasis on ritual body postures and how accessible mm -hmm. it is for people to experience this innate ability, as Laura and Paul have said. So I just was curious about how that might fit with what's what you're also doing with the Galileo Commission. It seems like a practice worthy of being studied and potentially included. Thank yes, you. absolutely. Well well send me more send me more details. Um, we'll have a discussion. Already I'm seeing correlation yeah. Yeah. Uh, to that. The honoring the body, make a gesture, the fact that you send it out to four directions, part of our ritual is to acknowledge mm -hmm. the universe in six directions. And to just okay, engage yeah, absolutely. consciously uh, below and really and above. say a prayer. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Brian. Thank yeah. you, Brian. Well, the, so. the panurhythmy has these has these three, the vertical, horizontal dimensions as well. And so to the extent that you're doing gestures with your feet uh, barefoot on the earth, 
um, then you are relating to the earth. To the extent that you are doing gestures together, um, then in the circle of the panurhythmic, um, then that's that that is the the horizontal dimension. And then, and then you tune into the divine dimension, which is the other vertical dimension. And yeah, these you have to knock on together. that door for that door to yeah. open. Exactly. And so, you know, I love that there's so many pathways for this that have been found and practiced through time and yeah. that we bring into our present day as well. Yeah. Just this continuation. Mm -hmm. So I think we're all tapping the same source. Yeah. Are we not? It's tapping us, right? Yeah. So. Well, and, and the diversity is important. I don't think yes. there's one way. We're going to um, each find what we're resonating with. Nature itself with. thrives on diversity, and and that's what the, you know, the big ag and the big food and so on. They're trying to reduce diversity and and create monocultures, which makes them very vulnerable. Monoculture of uh, the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, and even of thought, right? And the mind, and that's of what Vandana Shiva talks about: the monocultures of the mind. Yeah. And, you know, Goodman would say something very interesting that would relate to what you've just described. She would say, you can take all of the cultural knowledge away of our spiritual practices. They would arise again and again. Why? Because we have this capacity within us that seeks, that finds, that discovers, that energizes, that connects to the universe. We're going to find ways to connect. We are connected. We're going to find ways to amp up that connection. So you're using the same physiology the same vehicle the same earth suit over and over again we'll find ways mm -hmm. to to connect so uh we have just a few more minutes so anybody else have something to share to say to ask or what would you like to ask this community um david yeah. well i we all don't know go. very much about felicitas goodman's work but i do know that it had a huge influence on a late anthropological friend of mine um, and I remember him talking, uh, Paul Williams he, he died this year mm. um, he and I taught together at Winchester College in in the 1980s um, and I do I remember him talking about this work um, and and um, one of the one of the books I've reviewed this week is is um, is called Contemporary Voices from Anima Mundi um, oh. by Frederick Professor Frederick Apfel Marglin from Smith College. And, and that gives you some insights, particularly in, in Peru and other countries of South America, into the indigenous shamanic um, practices and, and the role of entheogens uh, in initiation. And, and, and that, that's very, very powerful because we are the modern Western materialistic view is like flatland. You know, it doesn't. Recognize, <laughs> I know that book. I know that book. Yeah, it doesn't recognize the vertical and inner dimension as important in its own right, and and that's thank you. That's what that, as you say, that's already within us, mm -hmm. um, and so it just needs to be tapped into, and um, and that is part of the exploration of consciousness. <laughs> I appreciate the role of entheogens, but what we do is we activate the entheogens within us that the yeah. body manufactures its own um pharmacopoeia and and we can activate that through through ritual mm -hmm. body posture yeah and i think the sacred context is really critical <clears throat> um, here and and that's what we that that's i mean if you go into Chartres cathedral i spent a week in Chartres last um summer uh, i mean that there <clears throat> there you're in a kind of cosmos in stone as tom yeah. Bree. Um, would put it and you're in a sacred space yeah. um, which is charged with atmosphere and experiences of people throughout the ages uh, throughout the ages I want to say that you also uh, have researched a lot you even you and your wife even lead a tour on uh, the Cathars you live in the Cathar country in France so tell me what is the connection to the Cathars and this what we've been talking about this this uh, acknowledgement, the divine feminine of the role of consciousness, of the role of wisdom. Tell us the connection. In general, yeah. And we'd like to invite yeah. you to tell us more about the Cathars. We can do it yeah. 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 
Yes, I, I, I well, I'll, I'll give you a sort of int introduction. <clears throat> um, but the, I think the point from <clears throat> the conversation we've been having this evening is that um, <clears throat> they were practitioners of gnosis. Um, that, the, in other words, it's experiential. Um, yes. And if you have direct experience of the divine, you don't need the church to tell you what to do. <laughs> and that's the problem. That's a problem for the authorities in the church because they right. depend on um on being able to tell you what to do um, yeah i'm the threshold guardian you only get them. here through me that's what the priest yeah, and, you know, yeah. and the extra extra ecclesia nulla salus which means outside the church there is no salvation yeah and there is and um, and that was the problem and the the point um one of the other points about the cathars is that their initiates were both men and women and um, and this this was a reflection of the Occitan culture of the time, um, that, that there was a much greater equality of men and women. Women could own property, for instance, which they couldn't in other parts. And that was also fed by the troubadour influence of what they called fin amour, um, which is refined love, um, which saw the feminine in, in very much, oh yes, more refined terms if you like and so the whole troubadour movement they spread throughout europe um, and and they created a, an important impulse mm. um you have a poem that you want to read us you also are a poet yes um i will read you um this is one i wrote in <clears throat> in florence <clears throat> last year when i was visiting my daughter and it's called Deep Time Trauma. I like and, that title. And, <clears throat> at the top, I've got a quote from the French poet Arthur Rimbaud, um, where he says, I am another, je est un autre. So here's the poem. Few and far between are those who dare to dive deeply into hidden recesses, hmm. descending into the dark womb of nascent life where healing awaits. Instead, we hold on, struggle on the surface, securely barricaded behind our many scars and wounds. Traumas seep through, stains of suffering from deep time, penetrating even the screens of our distracted attention. Who knows who we really are? Those who remember those who reconnect to joy, those who make music, create beauty, dancing in the moment, enabling life and love to flow once more. Beautiful. I, I think we're all suffering from PTSD as a culture because we've broken that lifeline, right? And it's up to each of us to find it again. So many of us are, recovery. but as a culture, we're, we're suffering from that. Yeah. We're all in recovery. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And, and another point, please. Yeah. Yes, let me Asking just open another. up. Um, I'll do. I'll. I'll just. I'll. I think I'll do the um the black, black Madonna um with the um, the blessing of the Divine Mother. Um, and I wrote these in Sharj last year. And so the you had to picture this, <clears throat> the black Madonna. Is the Madonna that is paraded through through the streets of Shard on the fifteenth of August, which is the Ascension Day, oh. um, and it's bedecked in flowers. It's quite small; it's only twice the size of the screen, um, and obviously the child is sitting in the lap of the Madonna, and the Madonna is sitting on a chair, and it's probably oak. And so this is my <clears throat> this is my poem on Black Madonna which I'll follow by the blessing. Upright she sits in regal stillness, her shining bliss resplendent irradiates our very being to its core of darkness. Eyes closed, her presence descends en static, embracing the heart of the grail rooted deep within her secret womb. The silently expectant world awaits a truly cosmic birth. 
The child divine transfigures, transmutes black stone to golden glow, transmits his dazzling blaze, transfusing sacred blood as healing wine of life and love. And then here's the blessing of the Divine Mother, which I wrote, and <clears throat> Andrew Harvey liked it, um, which is a good thing. May the golden blessing of the Divine Mother descend into my soul and dwell within my heart. May I be infused with the tender power of her spirit. May I be a living channel for her love and light, her beauty and peace in the circle of my world. Beautiful. Right on. David, fabulous, fantastic, uh, just so impressive. And you're actually a walking library as well because <laughs> you've got your, your ability. Well read. You're, you're right. Yeah, you're really well read. And you remember the titles and the authors and the. Uh, Everything in, no, it's in right in where between. they're on the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you want to know next? I got it straight over here. <laughs> so thank you so much. This has been fabulous, fantastic. We are going to get back together again. Carthars is one of the topics we'll talk about. And uh, but in we general, have a massive guest list, so you yeah. can hook us up with all of these well, we various with, yeah. researchers, so we can whatever you feel is appropriate. The conversation yeah. in these various aspects. Yeah. Yeah. No. Very happy to. Oh. Yeah. Thank you very much. What a great. Thing this morning <laughs> yes it, it was absolutely well thank you all and uh very impressive and um keep up the good work yeah keep up the good work thank you david great well thank you and uh have a very good day if you're on the other side of the pond the rest of your day yes for me, <laughs> time time for a bit of dinner yes um, <laughs> i'll again check on my dogs downstairs check they're okay um <laughs> so, Thanks so much for your invitation. <laughs> All the best. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. Okay, bye bye. Okay, blessings bye. to everybody. Healthy, <laughs> you know, thoughts and love. Yeah.